It was one of the greatest moments in sports history. It was 1980, Lake Placid, New York. It was the semifinal match between the Soviets and the Americans in the Olympics. It was a David versus Goliath sort of match. You see, the Russians were unbeatable. They were a hockey powerhouse. They had won the last four Olympic gold medals. Every single player on the Russian team played professional hockey. The Americans, by contrast, their opponents were laughable. It was a ragtag bunch of players, some in college, some amateurs, but none played professionally. And many were amazed that this team had even made it to the Olympics. Only two weeks prior, the Americans and the Soviets had faced off. The Soviets had thrashed the Americans to a, by a score of 10 to 3. Everyone expected that the match on this day would be the exact same. Only it wasn't. You see, the Americans came out with fire in their blood. They were ready to play. The Soviets scored first, but the Americans responded with an equalizer. At the end of the first period of play, it was a surprising 2-2. Now in the second period, the Soviets again scored first. But eight minutes later, the Americans responded. At the end of the period, 3-3. No one could believe their eyes. At the third period, as it began, it was, a matched, it was a pitched battle, each team going back and forth. With ten minutes left in the third period, the American, Mike Ruzzioni, he slipped a shot past the Soviet goalkeeper. It was four to three. The entire world was stunned. The Soviets, most of all. And as the minutes ticked down, the Soviet team responded, attacking vigorously, frantically shooting from everywhere. But the American goalie was impassable. Nothing could get by him. As the final seconds ticked down on the clock, announcer Al Michael screamed, Do you believe in miracles? Earning the title of this match, The Miracle on Ice. Because that day, what happened was truly something of a sports miracle. The unbeatable had been beaten. The Russian dynasty had been dethroned. One sports commentator said, this was the greatest upset in sports history. Now, as incredible as the victory was on that day, as in un incredible and unthinkable as was the defeat of the Soviet superpower, there's an even greater victory there's an even greater victory over a greater opponent. In fact, you could rightly say it would be the greatest victory in the history of humanity. And the Apostle Paul records that for us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have here in this passage the defeat of man's greatest foe. We see the death of death in our passage. It is the resurrection. Death, that, that merciless enemy that stalks all of us. That cunning thief that steals the breath from the lungs of every man and woman and child. That cold wind that snuffs out the candle of our lives. None can escape it. None can outrun it. None can outlast it. Governments can't regulate it. Medicine can't stop it. Religion can't avoid it. Death is truly man's greatest foe. And try as mankind might, we cannot escape death. Its slow and steady march advances day by day. And it will catch all of us at some point. And yet, in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says that for the believer, death has been defeated. For the believer, death has been mastered. 
And in our passage today, we witness the greatest victory ever recorded. We see the death of death. We see the unthinkable achieved. We see the demise of death. So before we launch into verses 50 to 58 and and witness this incredible victory over an insurmountable foe, let me just give you a quick recap of where we've been the last two weeks. Remember, we're in 1 Corinthians 15, which is Paul's magnificent treatise on resurrection. And we started in in verse 35, where Paul was responding to the questions asked by the mockers, asked by those who doubted the validity of the resurrection. And they said, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Paul responds to their questions by giving an analogy. He presents an analogy from nature and he says, just as a seed is planted in the ground and dies and then gives new life in a new form, so also is your body buried in the ground at death so also does it raise with new life in a new resurrected form. Then Paul looks to the created order. He looks at the variety of creatures God has made, and he says, if God can make so many different kinds of animals and creatures and so many different spheres and realms, is he really that troubled to make one more body for you, a resurrection body? Then he looks to the sky and he says, see the planets and the stars, see the suns and the moons. All of those heavenly bodies have a different manifestation, a different radiance of the glory that they emit. And Paul says, in like manner, your resurrected body will have a glory distinct from your physical earthly body. And then in verse 42, he begins to give more information about the nature of this resurrected body. He says, this physical body that you have is buried in the ground. And it's buried, it's perishable, it's dishonorable, it is weak, it is natural. But the body that comes out of the grave has altogether different characteristics. It's not subject to death it's imperishable it's immortal it's not shameful it's perfectly glorious it's not weak it's perfectly powerful and it's not natural it's perfectly like the body of Christ yes our physical bodies are in the image and likeness of Adam who was the prototype for humanity We have earthly bodies just as Adam had an earthly body. But the resurrection body, the resurrection body that God transforms and raises out of the grave, this is a body that is like Christ's body. That's why he says in verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Because the body that you will have one day at your resurrection, will be a copy, a perfect, glorious copy of Christ's resurrection body. And so that brings us to our passage this morning, verses 50 to 58. Here we find the magnificent conclusion to Paul's treatise on the resurrection. Like a master conductor, Paul brings this symphony to a dramatic conclusion. The music swells from pianissimo to fortissimo. And Paul explains what is to come. In this passage, Paul reveals three glorious truths about the resurrection that are meant to inspire you and empower your service in this life. Three truths, glorious and wonderful, about the resurrection to come that is meant to ignite your service today. In verses 50 to 53, Paul wants you to remember the great transformation. In verses 54 to 57, Paul wants you to rejoice in the great exclamation. And in verse 58, Paul wants you to respond to the great culmination. 
And the first glorious truth that Paul presents here is that you should remember the great transformation. Remember the great transformation that is to come. And we find this in verses 50 to 53. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. Here we have the great transformation that Paul sets forth for us in these verses. And now the question is, what sort of transformation is Paul writing about here? What is he describing? Well, he's describing the transformation of the body. See, when he says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of, of heaven, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, he's telling you that this mortal body was not fit for heaven. This body isn't meant to last in heaven. Uh, that phrase, flesh and blood, that signifies um, the human body. See, when it's used in the New Testament as such, flesh and blood, it speaks of that which is human as opposed to that which is spirit. In Ephesians 6, 12, Paul says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Paul is saying that as believers, we don't battle humans. Other people are not our enemy. Rather, it's the spiritual forces of wickedness against whom we fight. Hebrews 2.15 speaks of Christ and it says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise also partook of the same. The idea is that Christ took on human nature. He took on a human form that he might identify with man in his sin bearing. So when Paul says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, he wants you to know that your physical body was not meant for heaven. You need a different body. He says it can't inherit the kingdom of God. As believers, we know that we have an inheritance, don't we? See, 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 tells us about the future inheritance awaiting us. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now catch this. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven, for you. So you have an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, cannot fade away, cannot decay, cannot disappear, and it is stored and waiting for you in heaven. But Paul says, in this present form, you can't access it. In this present body, you can't enjoy all that God has for you in the life to come, in the age to come. So you must be transformed. Just as your inheritance is imperishable, so must you have an imperishable body in order to enjoy it. Paul reiterates it at the end of verse 50, just in case you didn't quite grasp it. He says, the imperishable, nor does the imperishable inherit nor does the perishable, rather, inherit the imperishable. Again, he's saying, your body wasn't meant for heaven. It must become more than it is. God must transform this body into something fit for eternity. Because these bodies, as you know, they all have a, a shelf life, right? Like a jug of milk in the fridge. You can't leave it in there too long because once it passes that expiration date, and you take it off and you're about to pour yourself a glass and you sniff it and it smells awful because it's gone off. It's been, it's spoiled. In the same way, these bodies will spoil. These bodies aren't meant to last forever. They have a, an expiration date. 
So we need a new body. We need a transformed body. And in verse 51, he says, Behold, he continues his argument. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, when, when we hear the word mystery, often we think of something that uh, has to be solved, some enigma, something we don't understand, but if we think about it hard enough, we can put together the clues and come to a solution, find the answer. We think of the great Sherlock Holmes and his partner Watson and how they solve mysteries together, and, and, and so we think a mystery is something like that, and for us it is, but that's not the way Paul uses mystery here. In Paul's day, that's not what a mystery meant. And especially in context of the New Testament, a mystery isn't an enigma. A mystery, rather, a mystery is something that was concealed in the Old Testament, but it has since been revealed in the New Testament. You see, it's something that the Old Testament saints wouldn't have understood because God didn't give them enough information to understand it. But... For the church age, for us, through the New Testament, we now have answers that the Old Testament saints did not. That's what Paul's talking about when he says, here is a mystery. And there are different mysteries in Scripture. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul says the indwelling Christ is a mystery. No Old Testament saint would have ever thought that somehow the Savior would reside inside. They couldn't have ever imagined that. In Romans chapter 11, the unbelief and hardening of the Jews, well, that's also a mystery. No Old Testament saint would have thought that the Jewish race, the people of Israel, would have been hardened so that Gentiles could come into the kingdom. That is a mystery. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says the inclusions of the Gentiles into the church, that's a mystery. Because the Jews didn't like the Gentiles. And the Jews didn't want the Gentiles as part of the people of God because they couldn't be. Only Jews were the people of God. And so Paul says in Ephesians 3 that here is a mystery. God has so designed it that Jew and Gentile would be made one through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. By his blood, enemies are made friends. And in our passage, he introduces yet another mystery. A mystery that the Old Testament saints would never have conceived, but which Paul now reveals to us. And you may ask, what is this mystery? What is this thing that no one in the past would have known? Well, this mystery is the rapture of the church. It's that mystery which says Christ will one day come back To gather up all his people and bring them to heaven with him. He'll gather the dead and the living who are his. And so the implication is, and it comes out in this verse, is that not all will die. In fact, that's why Paul says, we will not all sleep. Because not all will die. Now the the first seed of this mystery of of rapture. It actually appears in John chapter 14. So come with me quickly to John chapter 14. Verses 1 to 3 is when Christ first introduces the concept of the rapture. An entirely brand new idea at the time. And so in John chapter 14, the disciples are in the upper room. They stand in the shadow of the cross. Soon Christ will march to Gethsemane, to the garden. He will be captured He will be bound, he will will go through the different trials, and they will take him, bearing his own cross, to Golgotha. But here, before all of that occurs, he's with his disciples in the upper room, at the Last Supper. And he says in John 14, 1, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
Notice what he says in verse 2. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. That's heaven. There are some kind of dwelling places in heaven. And Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. He's saying my imminent departure is part of God's plan that I may go prepare a wondrous home for you. And in verse 3, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you there may be also. Jesus is saying, I'm going, but I'll come back. I'll come back to get you. Now, you may be wondering, how do I know that this is the rapture? Why do I know that John 14, 1 to 3 is talking about the rapture and not simply the time when Jesus comes back to vanquish all his enemies? Because if you remember in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus already told them he's coming back to slaughter his foes. The parable of the tares, the parable of the dragnet, those teach us that Christ will come back as a conquering king and he will destroy his enemies. But here... In John chapter 14, there's not a word about enemies. There's not a word about judgment. So we know this can't be the same event Christ is talking about. This must be something new, something separate, something distinct. And in fact, it is. Jesus is talking about the rapture when he will come back to gather up his own. That's what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is saying... I will tell you a mystery. He's talking about the mystery that Christ unfolded in its seed form in John chapter 14. But now Paul gives more information. He expands upon this idea of resurrection, of of rapture, and he says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And sleep is a metaphor for death. It's common in the New Testament to refer to someone's sleep as Uh, someone's death, rather, is their sleep. And and when you think about it, sleep is a fitting way to describe death. Several years ago, when I was in graduate school in Oklahoma, I was going home for Thanksgiving. And so I was bringing home some Chinese students with me. It was about a five-hour trip, and I was looking forward to a lot of good conversation in the car. I was going to be driving. They're going to be my passengers. I thought, hey, we're going to have good talks Usually I just made the drive solo. So I was excited to have company. But it didn't turn out the way that I had hoped. About 30 minutes into the trip, I looked over and all of them were asleep. Every one of those guys fell asleep on me. And they slept clean through the entire trip. And for them, that was the best trip they'd ever taken. They got in the car, they leaned back, Before they knew it, they closed their eyes, they opened their eyes, and voila, they're here. That's what sleep is like. That's why the Apostle Paul likens death to sleep. Because for the believer, death is nothing more than sleep. You close your eyes on this planet, you open your eyes in the presence of Christ. Reminds you of 2 Corinthians 5.8, doesn't it? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. When you die, you will be transported to the presence of Christ. So for the believer, death is no more than sleep. Death isn't something to be afraid of. Death isn't something to terrify you. Richard Sibbs, the Puritan, he said, Death is only a grim porter to let us into a stately palace. In other words... Death is the doorman who opens the door into the kingdom of heaven for you. He ushers you in to meet your God. Death isn't something to be afraid of. The Apostle Paul says we will not all sleep. Some will be alive at the return of Christ when he comes. But, Paul wants you to know, we will all be changed. Those who are dead and those who are alive, all of them must be transformed. All must receive that glorified body. In 2 Corinthians 5.4, Paul talks a bit about this transformation. He says, For indeed, while we were in this tent, and when he speaks about this tent, the context of verse 1 indicates he's speaking this physical body. So Paul says, Indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. 
Paul is saying that he longs for the day when his physical body will be swallowed up by that which is eternal. And he can't wait to receive his glorified body. He can't wait to have that supernatural spiritual body designed to last forever in eternity with his Savior Christ. That's the change Paul is speaking about when he says, we will all be changed. And then he, he says it happens in a moment. It happens in a moment. That word moment is the word from which we get Adam. The English word Adam comes from that particular Greek word for moment. And it, it describes the irreducible minimum. It is that, that unit which is so small, you can't subdivide it any further. It's the absolute bare minimum. Can't cut it in half anymore. It's already too small. And so Paul says it happens in a moment, in a flash. He actually says, in the twinkling of an eye. Did you know that a twinkling is a real thing? So scientists say that a twinkle is the amount of time it takes for light to pass from your retina and hit your iris. So to give you some perspective on how quickly that happens, scientists have measured that. And they say you can blink your eye in three-tenths of a second. So we blink all the time, right? We don't even notice it because it happens so quickly. Three-tenths of a second you blink. But a twinkle is much faster than a blink. A twinkle, scientists say, occurs in one-sixth of a nanosecond. Now, I know I'm with a very smart group of people, so you don't need me to, for me to explain how fast that is, right? Well, in case you forgot, a sixth of a nanosecond is one-sixth of a billionth of a second. Our human minds don't have a capacity to grasp just how fast that is. It is essentially instantaneous. That is what Paul is saying. That's precisely Paul's point here. The transformation that occurs as those bodies come out of the grave and as those who are alive rise up to be with the Lord, he says that transformation from natural to spiritual, from perishable to imperishable, from weak to powerful, from dishonorable to glorious, that transformation is instantaneous. And he says... It happens at the last trumpet. This is the same trumpet the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is not the last trumpet that will ever sound in human history, but it is the trumpet that signals the end of this era of human history. It is the trumpet that signals the end of the church age. It signals the rapture. So come with me quickly to 1 Thessalonians 4. We read that earlier, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, is a parallel passage describing the rapture. It describes the transformation of our bodies. So let me start in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. What Paul is describing here is when Christ returns from heaven. Not for judgment, but to retrieve his people. Christ comes to gather all of his elect, the living and the dead. And it says, the dead rise first, then we who are alive will join them. And so what this says, just as Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 15, is that not all will be dead, but we will all be changed. And it happens in an instant. It happens instantaneously, that transformation. And it happens when that trumpet sounds to signal the coming of the next age. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says in, in verse 53, he reiterates, he summarizes what he's just been telling us. He says, the perishable must put on the imperishable. 
That's simply transformation is necessary. This mortal must put on immortality. So your bodies will be instantaneously, supernaturally transformed into the glorious body that God has for you. It will be transformed into something far greater. So Paul wants you to remember. Remember this great transformation. Remember this great transformation of the resurrection. But that's not all he has for us. No, he he not only wants you to remember the great transformation, he wants you to rejoice in the great exclamation. And the great exclamation Paul lays out for us in verses 54 to 57. He says in verse 54, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, and he's basically just summarizing what he already discussed, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. As Paul remembers the glorious truth about our great transformation, he can't help but get excited. He's like a pot that's boiling and the water just bubbles over. So is Paul's enthusiasm enthusiasm just rising to the surface here. And the excitement levels are building in here in him as he thinks about the transformation. And then as he thinks about the implications of that transformation. Look at verse 54. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now notice, this has not yet occurred, right? The immortal has not yet taken over the mortal. The imperishable has not yet replaced the perishable. So this is a yet future reality. We're still waiting for it. But when it occurs, Paul says, when you receive that resurrected body, death is swallowed up. Death will be swallowed up in victory. He's quoting Isaiah 25, 8. And that phrase, swallowed up, is something I want to just focus on for a moment. To swallow, swallow something up, the the idea is what you would imagine. You consume something, you eat it, it goes away, it ceases to be because you've consumed it. Well, the people in a tiny village in Indonesia experienced the terrifying reality of what it means to be swallowed up one day. You see, a lady had gone out into the fields to collect corn, but she didn't return. And so in the morning, and she lived with her sister, her sister woke up and and she was surprised to find that her sister who'd gone to collect corn hadn't returned. She was a bit concerned, so she went out into the field and she traced her sister's footsteps into the field. And mysteriously, they just stopped at a certain point. There was her sister's machete. There was her sister's sandals. There were her sister's there was her sister's flashlight, but no sister. So now she was very concerned. So she went back to the village and she roused everyone and she said, "Something has happened to my sister. I need you to come help find my sister." And so the whole town went out into the fields and they were searching and they were trying to find any evidence for what had happened to this missing lady. And then suddenly someone gave a shout. So they all collected at this point. And about 15 or 20 meters away from where the footsteps had ceased, they found a massive, bloated python. And they knew what had happened. And they didn't need to kill the snake, which they did, and discover what they had already feared. That python had caught the woman unawares at night. And he had literally consumed her entire body whole, swallowed her whole. And of course she was dead. That idea of consuming, of swallowing up, that's what Paul is communicating here. But this is not a tragic picture here. What Paul is describing 
is something glorious. Paul is describing how death has been consumed. How death has been swallowed up by something greater. Now I think we all know that death still affects us today, right? Even though for the Christian, death has been consumed by what Christ has done, and we'll get there in greater detail in the next verses. Death still affects us. It's been swallowed up, but it's still a present and active force. Death still cuts lives short. It rips people away from us from, due to cancer, unexpected car accidents, due to violent crimes. So death is a reality. We will all die ourselves. But for the believer, death is now impotent. It has lost the great power it once held over us. It holds no dread for us because we know the end of the story. That's why Paul says, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Because he knows that what Christ has done has destroyed death's power. He's quoting from Hosea 13, 14 here. Again, he's, he's looking back from the Old Testament and he's pulling the Old Testament into the New and explaining to, to elaborate on this mystery here of the rapture. And he says, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Now think about that word sting for a moment. Uh, the sting has to do with a poisonous snake. Say the, the bite of a poisonous snake or the, a, a bee when it stings you. So that's what sting means in this context. And it's a beautiful word picture. Because with a bee today, if a bee stings you, it leaves its stinger in you. It can only sting you once. It can only hurt you once. But then once it's, once it's stung you, that bee is essentially harmless. There's nothing to fear from that bee. Paul is saying death is like a bee whose stinger has been plucked out. Death is a bee busily buzzing around, incapable of stinging you because it's already lost its stinger. Now the question is, where did the stinger of death go? How has death lost its stinger? Let me tell you. Death plunged its stinger into the breast of Christ on the cross. When Christ hung there on that cross, death plunged its stinger into his heart. It delivered the full burst of its venom into Christ. That's why he went to the cross. Because he could withstand the venom of death. He could withstand the sting of death. And so, after death stung Christ, it has no more power for his people. It's, the stinger of death is stuck in Christ. So for the believer, there's nothing to fear from death. And in fact, Paul is so excited about that idea. Uh, he's so... So getting so emotional about, about that, that he launches into, in verse 56, he launches into this burst of theology. Because Paul has this brilliant theological mind, and as he's beginning to contemplate the fact that death has now been defanged, that death has no more venom, no more poison, then he just decides to give us a bit of theology to explain the relationship of sin and law and death. In 56 he says, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. Now that first part when he says the sting of death is sin. What he's saying is sin gives death its power. Sin energizes death. Hear Romans 5.12. Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin... And thus death is spread to all men. So death has power because sin exists. 
Where sin exists, death operates. But, because of what Christ did on the cross, because he has paid the penalty of sin, death has been defanged. The sting of death has been eliminated. Romans 5.17, same chapter as we just read. Romans 5.17 says, For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Paul wants you to know that death no longer reigns. Death no longer has a sting for you if you're a believer. And that is a marvelous, marvelous truth. But he doesn't end there. He says, no, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The idea is that the law reveals our lack of conformity to God's word. You see, the law of God exposes all of us as guilty. We're all guilty because none of us have lived up to the standard of the law. And Romans says, in Romans 2, that the law of God is written in our hearts. Of course we know the law is written in Scripture. But for those who say, well, I've never read the Bible, so I can't be held accountable to God. Nobody told me about His commands. Paul says in Romans 2, God has inscribed His law in your heart. So all men everywhere, all of us are accountable to the law of God. And what the law does is it rips off the mask of our own morality. It exposes the ugliness of sin within. So then, to summarize, the law, rather, yes, the law is the standard that reveals sin, and death is what gives sin its power. Now, you may be thinking that is very grim news. And were that the end of the chapter, that would be grim news indeed, because it has exposed all of us as lawbreakers. But, listen to verse 57. Listen to Paul's exclamation, explode forth. He says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has won the victory for us. Yes, the law revealed our sin. Yes, sin cast the shadow of death over us. Yes, the stinger of death was ready to plunge into our hearts. But then Christ intervened. Then Christ stepped in our place. And He took the blow for us. Christ took the stinger of death and He thereby won the victory. Death is no longer master of us. Hebrews 2 records that. In Hebrews 2 verses 14 and 15 it says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless. Catch that. He might render powerless him who had the power of death. Who is that? He tells us. That is the devil. Now listen to the result of what he's done. Verse 15. And he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Did you catch that? What Christ has done has burst the bonds of death for us. He's ripped the chains off of our wrists and ankles. And so now we are free. We're not prisoners, we're free. We are victors. That's why Paul can taunt death and say, where's your victory? Where is your sting? It's like the receiver in the NFL who scores a game-winning touchdown and he's dancing and flaunting his victory over the defenders and he's basically saying, you couldn't stop me. And look what I've done. That's what Paul is saying. That's why he's so excited about the victory that Christ has won for us. And Scripture says, on account of what Jesus has done, we are conquerors. Romans chapter 8, verse 33, verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. And then in the next verse, He gives this list of things that can't separate us from Christ. The first one. Do you know what the first one in that list is? It's death. Death can't separate us from the love of Christ. Because death has been mastered. 
by Christ. Not only are we victors, not only are we glorious conquerors, we're also wonderful overcomers. 1 John 5 says that. It says that believers are those who through their faith, through their faith in Christ, have overcome the world. Do you see, as believers, because of what Jesus Christ has done, not because of what you have done, not because of what I have done, not because of what any man has done, we have a victory through Jesus Christ. So we are overcomers. We are conquerors. We are victors. So Paul can rejoice. And he can call you to celebrate in this moment. He can call you to rejoice in this great exclamation. Because death has been defeated. Death has been put into the grave. And believers have eternal life awaiting them. That is what believers have in store for them. But I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't say that that victory has not been won for every man and woman. The victory that Christ has secured is a victory that comes to those who have repented of their sins. It is a victory that comes to those who have placed their faith exclusively in the, the God-man Jesus Christ. Christ has won the victory, but it is not automatically applied to everyone. We're not universalists. We don't believe we'll all be saved. But Christ's death can save. And so if you're not a partaker of this victory of Christ today, if death hasn't been mastered in your life, then what it means is death is still lurking for you. The stinger of death is still dripping with poison. And one day, if you don't know Christ, it will find your heart. And death's stinger will plunge into the very heart of your being. And you will go to hell. But victory is possible. Christ has won the victory. Romans 10 says, Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If that is you this morning, then my plea would be that you would turn to this Christ. Turn to the one who has mastered death. Turn to the one who has done what you could never do and receive his forgiveness so that you too will be a victor and a conqueror. We have one last magnificent truth in this passage. It appears in verse 58, and Paul wants you to know that you must respond to this great culmination. Let me explain what that means. He says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. This is the, the culmination of, of Paul's entire chapter on resurrection. That therefore signals to you that, that this is where the end of the road leads. This is the mountain peak of this passage. Everything crescendos here. This is the pinnacle and the summit. This is where the application must come from, Paul says. And he says, listen, because everything I've told you is true, you must live differently. You must respond. And I could summarize his words in verse 58 in this way. You must be firm and you must be faithful. You must be firm and you must be faithful. That first idea of firm, uh, that's expressed in Paul's words. He says, be steadfast, be immovable. Be steadfast and immovable. Steadfast has the idea of being seated in place. You're not walking around. You're not bouncing back and forth. You're seated in place as you are right now. You're steadfast. But immovable is a stronger word. Immovable means you are motionless. You're not only fixed in place, you're not shifting even a degree. You're not rocking, you're not shaking, you are like a statue rooted in the ground. 
what Paul means is be firm in your belief in the resurrection. The Corinthians were being assaulted to deny this truth. Some of them were already denying it. So Paul says, no. No, be firm. Hold on to this magnificent truth. There is a bodily resurrection. You must cling to it. Because if you don't, you will begin to live like the world. You will be like those who say, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we perish. That's how the rest of our world lives, is it not? They don't believe in a bodily resurrection, so today they do whatever they want. They indulge in every pleasure, pursue every passion. But Paul says, no, you must release those things because the resurrection is true. What do you need to let go of because of the resurrection? What sins are you clinging to because you love the world? What needs to be removed from your life, cut out from your life so that you can live in the purity of one who expects to live in the presence of God. The second idea Paul has, not only should you be firm, not only must you be firm, but you must also be faithful. You must be faithful. That's what he means when he says we should always be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil is not in vain. That's why he says always abounding. Not sometimes. Not when you feel like it. Not when you're zealous. We must always be abounding in the work of the Lord. That word abound means to go above and beyond. It's not just just what is necessary. It's to exceed, to surpass, to go further. You must abound in the work of the Lord. We must keep our hands to the plow, Paul is saying. That word toil, knowing that your toil is not in vain, it comes from a Greek word that describes a beating. Describes a beating. And the idea is, it's like a man who has been so thoroughly beaten that he's just a heap on the floor. He can't move. And Paul says, We are to live that way, to so exhaust ourselves for Christ, to so strive in His service, not strive to win heaven, not strive to earn God's favor, but being secure in the favor Christ has already won for us, we are to exhaust ourselves in His service. It's like a marathoner who approaches the finish line He's given it everything he's got. He's got barely enough strength to make it to the finish line, but he can't quit now. It's in view. The crowds have all assembled. They're lining up. All he must do is make those last few steps and stumble across the finish line, exhausted. But he's made it. But he's made it. That's the image of what the believer is to be in this life. I think Spurgeon summarizes it well. He says, if by excessive labor we die before reaching the average age of man, worn out in the master's service, then glory be to God. We shall have so much less of earth and so much more of heaven. It is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Christ. Spurgeon got it. Spurgeon got it. That ought to be our mindset, that we will be those who are so thrilled by the glories of what is to come, so excited for the treasure ahead of us, for the reward, that we are willing to invest it all into serving Christ in this life, that we hold nothing back, that we tirelessly serve, that we tirelessly pray, that we relentlessly evangelize. That's what Paul wants for us. And there is a reward reward waiting. There is a reward. Remember Matthew 5. Do not store up for yourselves treasures in earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
every ounce of energy that you invest into the Christian life, every ounce of energy, every minute you pour into it in service of Christ will be rewarded in heaven. You won't lose even a penny. And it'll be a reward that'll far surpass and exceed what you could ever imagine. So Paul says, be firm and be faithful. Your toil is not in vain in the Lord. In our passage this morning, Paul has unveiled three powerful truths. He wants you to remember the great transformation that will occur. Your body will be transformed into something spectacular. Paul also wants you to rejoice in the great exclamation. Christ has mastered death. Death has been defeated. We have no more enemy. Finally, he wants you to respond to the great culmination. Respond to this truth by pouring out your life for Christ. Isn't that what Paul said? My life has been poured out as a drink offering. And that is what he is calling us to do as well. Let me leave you with a man who did just that. The story of a man who did that very thing. Henry Martin was born in Cornwall, England in 1871. Sorry, 1781. He was converted at a young age, and as he went through school, he showed tremendous promise. Brilliant in mathematics, a keen mind. He was looking to go to law school. He had a very bright future ahead of him. The sky was the limit for Henry Martin. But everything changed when he began to read and hear about the lives of great missionaries of old. He heard about William Carey, the missionary to India. He heard about David Brainerd, the missionary to the Native Americans in the U.S. And when he heard about those men, an evangelistic blaze ignited in his soul. And he knew that he could no longer live his life in the way that he had planned. He committed his life to the spread of the gospel from that point forward. A few years later, he prepared to board a ship to India. He was only 25 years old. He was leaving behind his friends. He was leaving behind his family. He was leaving behind the woman he loved. He left the woman he loved and wanted to be married to because she wouldn't go. She wouldn't go to India. She wouldn't accept the costs. So Henry Martin said, I will go. He boarded that ship. After many long months, he arrived in India. And he set about to the task at hand, to the task of bringing the gospel truth to the peoples of India. As he landed, he exclaimed, Now let me burn out for God. Which is exactly what he did. In a few short years, Henry Martin compressed an entire lifetime of work. Worked tire tirelessly, vigorously, ceaselessly. And then something tragic occurred. His life was cut short at 31. His life was cut short by disease. But it was not the end of his labor. For you see, before Martin died, he translated the New Testament into Persian, Arabic, and Hindustani. His life was short, merely 31 years, but his impact was eternal. His was a life that truly blazed for God. My prayer is that we would be the same.